Jerry Seinfeld once said, a two-year-old was like a blender that you don't have a lid for. <laughs> a mom once said, you know, I'm not sure when kids are bored why they come to the one standing in front of a sink full of dishes asking what to do. The list can go on and on as a parent of the challenges and the humor that you find in it. And sometimes you may even find yourself wondering and asking, Lord, you know, <laughs> is this my, you know, is this a blessing and a heritage from you? What is this? But as they grow and as you see them grow in the Lord and you, and you come to love them and, and all the bumps and the bruises, pretty soon, yeah, it's worth it. Pretty soon, yeah, there's something more than just the struggles. There's something more than just the ups and the downs. As you begin to see the life that God has entrusted you with you, the, the special uh, stewardship, the special honor that it is to be a parent. But in a, a little bit different light, but I guess somewhat the same, as we'll finish out Matthew chapter 13 tonight, we looked at the parables of the kingdom tonight, today. <laughs> I'm already back here to listen to Toss. I don't know. <laughs> Be about like, you know, checking for those war tours. Uh, sometimes make sure. Anyways. They say the most important uh, part of communication is how you're understood. So we'll, we'll keep working on that, but. So as, as Jesus began to tell them the parables of the kingdom, it would have been quite difficult for them to hear. You see, as a young Jewish boy or girl, having the hope of the Messiah, the coming kingdom, was something very important to who you were, your national identity. And that when the Messiah come, came, just like the woman at the well, well, he's going to explain everything to us. Or as the disciples hoped, you know, they're going to throw off the yoke of Rome and, and saw, it was going to solve all of our problems. When the kingdom comes, righteousness will fill the earth. Old Testament promises. And Jesus came and he began to tell them that, you know, the kingdom was actually going to start quite differently than what they had expected. Things were going to go differently than what they had expected and what they thought they originally were signing up for. That in the, the, with the seeds, not everyone who heard Jesus and not everyone that hears the gospel today will believe. They found out that there would be false believers in the mix. They found out that there would be false doctrines in the mix. They found out that some of everything that they would even give their very lives for would have good and evil coexisting. That yet the, between the Messiah's first coming and second coming, there would be a mix. That there would still be evil. That there would still be an enemy and he'd be planting things. This would be important for them to know. Important for them to understand the scope of all that was going to happen in the kingdom and in our time, as it would become quite difficult. The kingdom parables, they needed to know this information. They needed to know that during this time period that it would really be marked not by um, the Messiah ruling with absolute authority and righteousness, but it would be marked more by a proclamation of faith. And salvation by grace through faith is how the Lord has always saved, but this time in the kingdom would be marked by that, by a profession of faith, and that ultimately God would sort it out in the, at the end, and that there are things that we won't be able to sort out, things we can't root out, that there will be problems in the midst of this work that he's called them to do. But would it be worth it? You know, like those days, I use those kind of couple silly illustrations of, of parenting. <laughs> and those days where you ask, would it be worth it? 
And it's a good question. It's a good question. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. God's feeling about the nation of Israel. God's feeling about the nation of Israel. You know, we have hard, had some hard truths in the middle of that, but Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. That was the nation of Israel to the Lord. That was the nation of Israel to the Lord. Acts chapter 15, beginning in, in verse 14. Acts chapter 15, beginning in verse 14. Simon has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out for, of them a people for his name. And with this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins, and I will set it up, so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who will do these things. A called people, a treasured people, and we'll, we'll kind of come back to the, the thought here in a, a, a minute of, was it all worth it? You know, we sometimes have gotten so back, stepped back from, from just the passion of the Lord for people. Because, you know, there will be these goofy movements in the church, like the, the seeker-sensitive stuff where they will go in and they'll pull and find out what people just like to do and they'll build the church around that just so that they can fill the church rather than what honors the Lord. But somehow in the mix of that when we want to stay away from from that we forget to be sensitive to the seeker. God so loved the world that he gave. The Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. In front of the bulletin, you need that reference, Luke 19.10. It's what he came to do. Revelation 3.20. He's standing outside the, the church, knocking on the door. Knocking at the door of your heart. Can I come in? The seeker, though we don't want to get caught up in modern movements, but neither can we throw the baby out with the bathwater and remember just the amazing, passionate love and desire that God has for an individual, has for you. So as they would see this kingdom and these men would bleed and die for this work, they'd be betrayed in the midst of this work. Would it all be worth it? Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 44. As we finish the first four kingdom parables last week, we'll do the, the next three. Beginning in verse 44. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid, and for joy over it he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Now I think these... These two, simp these three simple verses and these two simple parables, man, they just, they just really blessed me and affect my heart this week as I, as I thought about them. Before we kind of get back into the teaching, what Jesus is saying, you know, one thing I would note is that these two items, these two illustrations, they were in the world. 
and the world found no value in them. If you are looking and expecting the world to find that it's going to have some idea of your value or you're going to have some kind of intrinsic value to it, anything true, you're going to be sadly mistaken. Where you want to find, where you want to be valued will be in the Lord. Will be in the Lord. In verse 44, a man, a man, as we follow the interpretation from before, this is, this is Jesus. He found and hid. Now this first one, verse 44, I believe is a reference to the nation of Israel. That which has been found and will be hid and, and revealed again. That it is referred to several times. One, the Deuteronomy verse that we opened up with. Psalm 135, verse 4, and also in Exodus, as Yahweh refers to Israel as his treasure. As his treasure. Not forsaken, maybe for a time hidden. And he was willing to sell. He was willing to buy the entire field. He was willing to go and to sell all that he has and buy that field. Israel, not forsaken, not left out, not left behind, but the passionate love for God as he would go first to the lost house of the nation of Israel, willing to give up everything. And we know, we know that Adam blew it, the first Adam. Blew it. God gave him dominion, gave him all of these things, and he blew it. We lost it all. Now we're born dead under sin in a world under a curse. But now it's been repurchased. We see that in Revelation, which, Lord willing, we'll get into next year, as the Lamb of God who overcame. And he bought that field. He's going to rule and reign in righteousness over all the earth. He left heaven to buy it. Not because God needed more dirt. He didn't need another planet. Why did he do it? For the treasure. He bought this back and he's going to establish and fulfill the promise that he made to his servant David. He will have a king that rules on his throne. And it's going to last forever. In verse 45, I believe this, will, this refers to us as, as these three parables, as the first four describes kind of the beginning with Jesus all the way to the end and some of the characteristics and what's going to go on in it. I believe these last three give us a good idea of of who's going to be in it. And it begins off with Israel, and now this pearl of great price. See, this one, this, this merchant, there was, there was other things to be found, but there was one individual that was, wow, this is, this is something to be had. This is something beautiful. It's inter one interesting thing about a, you know, a pearl. It's made from a, a piece of foreign material be it a, a grain of sand, it can be made out of maybe a parasite that gets itself in there. And it, it's an irritate, it's an ir irritant. Something that inflicts pain, if you will. And the beauty of a pearl has nothing really to do with the irritant. But as it is this irritant that gets inside... My brain's going like clam, oyster, oyster. <laughs> Guess it's just a day for that. We'll just, we'll just enjoy it. <laughs> and as we learned before that, you know, from Daniel 7, Revelation 13, Revelation 17, oftentimes the, the sea is used as a picture of the nations, the Gentiles. And so as this piece of foreign material comes out of that, 
winds up in this oyster, this thing, and where it is, where it enters as an irritant. Something that's not supposed to be there. This oyster secretes a fluid. Nacre, I think it is. You have to look that up. And it slowly covers it. And as this, this secretion crystallizes around it, it becomes this beautiful white. And the longer it's there, the, more, the larger and more beautiful it come, becomes. And everything beautiful about it, everything that we treasure about a pearl has, again, you're not looking at the sand, you're looking at what it's covered with how it's grown during that time, all the substance that's not of itself. And the Lord here, he, he, he finds this pearl of great price. One other thing about a pearl is, is it's beautiful as, as, as it is covered in that. It's not cut. It's not like a diamond or, or so many other things that we find that, you know, you gotta, you gotta cut it and you gotta clean it up and you gotta do all these different things. But a pearl is beautiful as it has been made, as it has been covered, as it is found that way. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. You know one of the interesting things that will destroy a pearl once it's taken out? Human perspiration. I find that interesting. It's not the salt, and it's not the water. It's actually the pH. And it is interesting that one thing that really destroys the beauty which God covers our life with, his blood, his righteousness, is human works. What an interesting, what an interesting picture as it continues to build. This pearl of great price, he sold all that he had to buy it. I want to stop and meditate on that just for a little bit. Philippians chapter 2. And I'm actually going to read from the New Living Translation because I am not known for my linguistics. <laughs> I'm sometimes known for my lack thereof. But this really brings out the, the meaning of the Greek from, from that section of Scripture. Philippians chapter 2, and I'll be beginning in verse 5. Philippians 2, beginning in verse 5. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God, and died a criminal's death on a cross. What did Jesus not give up to purchase, to purchase you? Every glory of heaven... He laid it all aside. He didn't say that wasn't something for him to cling to, to covet, to, to hang on to, but instead he emptied himself completely and became the lowest, he became the servant of all. But it, wasn't, it didn't end there. It didn't end there. John chapter 19, verse, beginning in verse 28. See, he didn't just give up divine privileges. He didn't just give up a, a holy estate, a wonderful... I mean, it was God. But truly became a human, while never ceasing to be God. Gave up those that write the privileges. John chapter 19, beginning in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they, were, and they filled a sponge with sour wine, put on hyssop, and put it into his mouth. 
So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up the spirit. It is finished. A phrase meaning paid in full. Not only did the glorious God come from heaven to earth, not just to be worshipped and adored, but to, to give it all, the full price paid, a crown of thorns came to the people that he loved, came to his own, but his own received him not because they loved darkness rather than light. He was crucified, a criminal's death, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. One of the most painful ways of execution ever devised by man. And at the end, he didn't say, well, that's enough. You know, I'm tired of this. He said, it's paid in full. It's paid in full. What the first Adam lost, the field, if you will, the second Adam repurchased. And when he comes again, he will reclaim this earth and dominion over it, and we will be with him. He will claim his people Israel when they turn to him. He's going to have that pearl of great price. He's going to have you, those, <laughs> those so many of us who were started off as that irritant. <laughs> you know who you are. <laughs> Whom he covered and developed in everything beautiful, everything that has been revealed that is wonderful is what he's covered you with. And he sold all. He left heaven and he paid for it in full with his blood, with his life. So though we don't want to go down these rabbit trails of man's programs, let us not forget, as one would say, you know, nah, let, us, let us not forget the great love that God has for you. The passion for you. He didn't, he didn't like I said, he didn't need another planet. But he saw something that was of great value to him and he sold it all and paid it all. So what makes, what would make that to the disciples, to the early church worth bleeding and, and dying just to preserve the scriptures? They estimate through those 10 waves of persecution that would begin in their lifetime that between 3 to 5 million Christians would be killed. What makes the disease and this fallen world which we live, the, the, of which Satan is the God over, what, what makes it worth it for God to endure, to watch all of this happen, to see they estimate hundreds of millions that have died from the diseases over the years. The deaths from the Inquisition, the Crusades after the Reformation. A hundred million killed by communism last, last century, by government, including his people, the Jews, by Russia, by China. What would make it all worth it? Well, we know, not only from these two beautiful parables, but also from Peter. He said, man, God's not slack concerning his promises. What is he waiting for? and none should perish, that all should come to repentance. You and me, the people in this room, why did he endure all that? Why did he endure the cross? Why did he leave heaven? There was a treasure to be had. There was a pearl to be found. He didn't wrap it up in the first century, but he waited. Praise the Lord. No wonder when we, read, when we opened up the psalm at the very beginning of the service that, that as he mentions Israel as his treasure, they, that the psalm is open with, and praise the Lord, praise his name. There's nobody like him. There's a lot of people that would die for a king, but how many kings would die for their people? 
What a wonderful Savior that we have. Don't, find you, don't try to find your value out in the world. This pearl, this treasure, didn't find it out there. But by the one who valued them so much. So much. You are loved. You are in a world that contains tribulation and trouble. Absolutely. But that doesn't diminish for one second God's great love for you. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. What was on his mind when paying this price? Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. As they list the hall of faith, many of whom had very difficult lives and and were surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses in this. But it says during that, during this race that we must have endurance, it says before us, it says, look unto Jesus, Hebrews 12, 2, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What did he come out with that he didn't have before? Us. He had the throne. He had the glory which he shared with his father from the foundation of the world, John 17. But he came and for the joy that was set before him, he endured the shame. He left heaven and he paid the price. The scourging on his back, the breaking of his body, the pouring out of his blood that he might robe you and I with righteousness, that he might wash us in his blood and make us white as snow, though our sins were as as crimson, as red. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just thinking of a verse, and let me look it up before I mention it. <laughs> Since I didn't write it down in any notes or think about it, yeah. First Peter 2.9. We talked about this verse a little bit as, as we pulled away as elders and our wives and just seeking the Lord about next year and, and praying for you guys and, and what the Lord has and what He wants to do. This is a verse that really just well, sure really blessed me Saturday morning. Dale, Dale shared it little more in depth than I will, but 1 Peter 2, 9, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know, last week, we've had a few weeks with, you know, just some hard it's kind of some hard meat to chew on, but, but a good reminder today as we look at these parables, when was the last time you felt that from the Lord? That you remembered that, that you believed that this was your God's heart towards you, that he chose you on purpose. You know, he just didn't slip in the back door or accidentally get caught up. He chose you. He sees something in you that the world does not. When was the last time you felt that you were holy? We know that just like that sand, that parasite, that irritant, it wasn't of itself, but it was made white. When was the last time you knew that God was Jesus Christ's blood enough to make you white, to make you precious? Maybe just meditate on some of these things. Do you believe that? Do you believe Him? That you are a special person to God. Back in in Matthew. He bought it. He paid for it. He wanted it. Not seeker sensitive, but we must be sensitive to the seeker because He is seeking that which is lost. And he's seeking every part of your heart that you might love him with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. 
your neighbor as yourself. He's seeking that. He's seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Not about a building or a location, but a heart for God. Matthew chapter 13, back in 13, we'll pick back up in verse 47. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a dragnet that was cast into the sea and gathered some of every kind, which when it was full, they drew to the shore and they sat down and gathered the good into vessels, but they threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The, in, the angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, cast them into the furnace of fire, and they will be, there will be na- wailing and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said to them, Have you understood all these things? And he said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he said to them, Therefore every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out of his treasure things new and old. So this does dip, this parable dips a little bit back into the, the wheat and the tares. But I think even beyond that, it speaks into the time of the tribulation. Where I believe in these three parables, he's lining out those who will be in, in the kingdom, the thousand year reign. There will be the nation of Israel. There will be those who are redeemed out of the world, the church, the Gentiles, us. But there will also be people that um, seem to help God's people who are alive at the coming of, of the Lord and who will not be redeemed, but will be those who are ruled and reigned over in the, in the thousand year. And I think that this gives us a little insight on how that is possible. In Matthew chapter 25 It talks about the judgment of the nations, the separating the sheep and the goats. And those, and based on those things, some will enter and some will be cast out. And so I believe this parable gives us an insight on that, that that though there will be a treasure that's, that's bought and paid for, there will be a pearl that's bought and paid for, but there will also be at the coming of the Lord this big dragnet, if you will, and there'll be all sorts that are at the judgment of the nations. There'll be all sorts at the end, and the Lord will sort them out. Those who took care of Jews during that time, those who were understood what was going on, perhaps they managed not to get killed after the mark of the beast, hard to say. We know that it's not dealing with eternal salvation. We know that there are people in the millennial reign after Jesus comes back who aren't redeemed. The lifetime seems to be extended, but they will be ruled over with absolute righteousness and, and uh, they will occasionally rebel a little and God will withhold reign. Seems that a young person dies around 300, according to Isaiah. Things will certainly be different, but there is some that when Jesus Christ comes to to rule on the earth, that some will be allowed to be in that kingdom, not eternally saved and not ruling and reigning with him as we will be. Because it nowhere ever says that when he comes, he will kill everyone on the earth. So, interesting you can make of that what you will. Through all of that, I believe it speaks of the tribulation saints, those who will come through the tribulation time. The new and the old. As he ties these last parables together, he says in verse 52, Therefore, every scribe instructed concerning the kingdom of heaven is like a householder who brings out his treasure, things new and old. To understand the kingdom of heaven, both now in this intermediate time, if you will, and the kingdom that's coming, you must understand the new and the old. Out of the Old Testament, they miss the church. They miss this time. To understand how things were going to happen and why, they needed to bring out the new and the old. The scribe there is like a, a, a learned disciple who puts into practice. Don't forsake the Old Testament. Don't forsake the old Old Testament, 
2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, he said, it's all profitable. And if you want to be an, a person who serves the Lord and equipped for every good work, you need to know both. In 1 Corinthians 10, 11, reaching back to the writings of Moses in the Old Testament, he said, these things were written for our understanding, our admonition to teach us. We need the old and the new to understand the entire whole picture. We don't want to throw, throw it out. Verse 53. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished these parables that he departed from there. When he had come to his own country, he taught them in their synagogue so that they were astonished and said, where did this man get this wisdom? And these mighty works, is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? So they were offended at him. <laughs> I don't know where he got all his wisdom. That's offensive. <laughs> what? It's like, it's like trying to have a debate on Facebook. <laughs> I, I don't know where you got that. I'm offended. I don't know. Anyway, who knows? Just because, anyways. <laughs> so they were offended at him. Now imagine this. As Jesus had been, he had taught there before, right when he began his ministry, and they were going to throw him off a cliff because his head, hey, I'm the Messiah. They didn't care much for that. And so then he went up to Galilee and began to minister. And so now he comes back and he begins to teach again. You know, they're, they're wowed by the hometown boy. He's made the NFL. He's made the NBA. Okay, we didn't like you when you were a kid, but you're popular now, so come on back. So he comes back and he begins to teach. And they're offended at him. Hey, wait, wait a second. Isn't this just the carpenter's boy? We know his brothers. We know his sisters. Sorry, Roman Catholics. Mary had some more kids. <laughs> I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> but as he began to teach them, they said, what in the world? How is this possible? I don't understand. So they were offended at him. Familiarity sometimes breeds contempt. Isn't it interesting? And you should be encouraged by this if you feel that your, your life, your walk in the Lord can be sometimes mundane, simple, overlooked. The most spiritual man to ever walk the planet wasn't seen that way by his hometown. They, didn't, they looked at him and said, we know this guy. This was the most spiritual person to ever walk the planet ever will walk the planet. And they missed it. They didn't see it. Who is this guy? Verse 57. Or picking back up. So they were offended at him, but Jesus said to them, a prophet is not without honor except in his own country and in his own house. Now he did not do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Wow. 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 Now, one misunderstanding I don't want to walk down or skip over is it's not that wickedness or unbelief somehow quenched God's ability. It didn't overpower him like he came in with all this force and then just, oh, I'm power. It's my kryptonite, unbelief. I can't overcome it. No, it's not like that. Because he did give them the greatest sign, the most powerful sign ever shown, the resurrection to an unbelieving generation. It's not that he couldn't. I believe that God limits how much he will do to those who have no desire for it. God limits his blessings for those who have no desire for it. We know that God blesses everybody who lives on this planet. Rain, Mercy, the sun comes up, goes down, but there is a limit to that. There are blessings that they can't have because they have no desire for it. It's not 
a good illustration, I, I suppose. A hospital won't go out and heal people who are constantly denying that, they aren't, that they're even sick. It's not that, it, that the medicine is any less effective. It's not that it doesn't exist and it's not there. They just have no desire for it. Leave me alone. I don't want it. Okay. And so it's, it's not like a, a kryptonite to Superman thing. It's a more probably more of a pearls before swine thing. If you don't want it, you don't have to have it. So he didn't do a lot there. A prophet is not without honor in his own country. They loved darkness rather than light. That's the testimony that John gave about them in John chapter 1. They loved darkness. Here was the light of the world, the wisdom of God, the provider of life and light. And they didn't want anything to do with it. And so here they had Jesus grow up among them, teach them, come to them, share with them, and then departed because of their unbelief. Because of their unbelief, they didn't enter in. One day they might turn around and say, you know, has anybody seen Jesus lately? Because he wouldn't come back to Nazareth. This was kind of it for them. They didn't want him. Unbelief. Can we ask that maybe more on a spiritual note in our own life? Has, has anybody seen Jesus in me lately? Has, has anybody seen Jesus in our church lately, our communities? Are we trusting in the promise of God? Are we trusting that outside of these walls, in our families, in our communities, there is a pearl, there is a treasure that God is pursuing? A work in your life that He wants to do. Do we believe that? I think of, of when Jesus was going to raise Lazarus, one of the questions that he ends with about being the resurrection and the life. If anyone who believes in him, though he sees, though he dies, yet he will live. What do you believe this? Are we seeing Jesus in our life? Walked out. See, because the kingdom of God, is, it's, it's not in hibernation. It's not in hibernation. It's at work. And let us be a part of it. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, I want to go ahead and read that. It was a challenge to a church. Had many spiritual gifts and had lots of things going on. But, he, but as he would speak to them, he wanted to ask them this question about the real things and that they needed to walk out in their life? Interesting question. Interesting challenge to them. It says, examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you, know yourself, do, you, do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless indeed you are disqualified. But I trust that you will know that you are not disqualified. Hey, Corinthians, have you, have you seen Jesus in your life? You should. He's in you. And you'll know you're, you're not disqualified. Have we seen Jesus lately in our life? We're going to take communion this morning. And as we do, just, think, just maybe think about those. Begin to meditate on a few of those things. That treasure, that pearl, that God was and is seeking you. And are we seeing that evidence of a life of faith? Not just of confession once, but a life of faith that Jesus Christ is in you. As we talked about last week, you know, it was, that was something that was hidden from prophets and ages and generations, but has been revealed to you and I. Jesus Christ in you, the hope of glory.